If there is, uh, feel free to take it and turn to the book of Romans chapter 4. And if you don't have one at home, uh, you don't have a Bible at all, uh, then take that few Bible. That can be your Bible. And so we want you to be able to have a Bible uh, that you can uh, study with. And so take that Bible. If you don't have one, if you want to just use one today, maybe you forgot yours, then you can use uh, that one as well. So this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. So Romans 4 verses 9 through 12. And as you're turning there, I just want to reiterate what Brother Dustin said. We will have uh, all of our Wednesday night programs will take place this Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30. And so we decided to just go on ahead and push through. So Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30. No meal, but we will have Bible study. All right, with that out of the way, Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Now, if you remember, as we've been studying through the book of Romans, you remember that we... We began this study and we, we looked at uh, chapter 1 and we were looking at how the apostle was, was walking through this passage talking about the gospel which is, which is God's gospel. It is the gospel of God that he promised beforehand through the prophets and his holy scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh but declared to be the son of God in power through the resurrection. And then we saw how in verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul gave what is sort of this theme verse of the book of Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, or for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So this gospel, it is a set of objective facts about the person and work of Christ. And he says, this is... The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and to the Greek. Then in verse 17 he says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Then in chapter 1 verse 18, Paul launched this uh, discussion or really this, uh, this teaching about how everyone is Rightly condemned before God. Whether you are Jew or Greek, you are rightly condemned before God. And he talked about the society as a whole, a godless society, how it, it devolves as it rejects God and rejects God's law. It devolves into animalistic behavior, eventually not only giving approval or not only doing the things that God commands not to, but even giving approval to those who do it. In other words, they are calling good evil and evil good. Then we saw in chapter 2, verses 1 through, really 1 through 16, he looked at this idea of the morally upright who are still lost. Those who are morally upright and yet they are far from God. They are not in Christ. And we talked about how you cannot equate morality with righteousness before God. And then in verse 17 all the way through verse 29, he talked about how even a Jewish person, in spite of his ancestry, if he doesn't know Jesus Christ is far from God, he is, not, he is not saved by being Jewish. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, he starts and he starts talking about, well, then what advantage is there to being Jewish, right? Then in verse 9, what then are we Jews any better off? He says, no, not at all. For all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And then in verses 10, all the way through, really through verse 18, he talks about the total depravity of man. That sin has touched every aspect of our lives. Not that we are as bad as we could be, but that everything about us has been tainted with sin. So if, if sin were the color blue, then everything about this world, everything about us would be one shade of blue or another. And then in verse 21, he started talking about the righteousness of God through faith for those who believe in Christ. Then we looked at how Abraham and David, last time, both believed in the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. We saw how Abraham was saved before God because he believed. He was declared righteous as he believed God. It was counted or reckoned or imputed to him as, as righteousness. Which means that Abraham has nothing to boast about before God. It's what he says in verse 27. What becomes of our boasting it is... Excluded, And then in verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And then we ended with David giving us this great hymn here where he says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count sin. 
So over the last several weeks, we've looked at all men being condemned, rightly condemned before God, and then how we can be made right with God in Jesus Christ, declared righteous in Him. So this week, we are going to explore who is this salvation for in verses 9 through 12. Who is it for? Is it only for those who are, who are Jewish by descent? Is it only for those who are the circumcision, if you will? Remember, Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. And David is himself a Jew. So the question would naturally, naturally lead to, well, then is this for, for any and everyone who believes? Or is this promise? Are these promises to Abraham? Are they only for those who are physically descended from Abraham? And perhaps that's not a question we're asking today. But if you would have been living in the first century and you were a Jewish person, this is exactly the question that you would have been asking. In fact, there was a great uh, sort of turmoil in the church that had to deal with the fact of whether or not Gentiles needed to be circumcised so that they could become Christians. In other words, do they need to become Jews first, then become Christians? And of course, Acts chapter 15 gives the answer, which is absolutely not. But Paul here in verses 9 through 12 is going to answer a couple of questions for us in his own way. Number one, do Jewish people, or rather do Gentiles, need to become Jewish to be saved? And then the second question he's going to answer is, well then why then was Abraham circumcised? So do Jew or Gentiles need to become Jewish in order to be saved? And why then was Abraham circumcised? So... With that as our backdrop, and I know that's lengthy, but it's been a few weeks since we were in the book of Romans, so I wanted to re-catch you up. Let's read verses 9 through 12 of the fourth chapter. God's word begins and says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised, or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. So faith equals righteousness here, counted to him as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Let's pray this morning and ask God's blessing and his assistance on his word as we study. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this morning with our Bibles open. And Father, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us to see wonderful things in your word. Father, we pray that we would rightly divide it, that we would rightly understand it, and then that we would rightly apply it. And Father, we know that only in the power of your Holy Spirit can these things be discerned. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to see them. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, we know that your word never returns void, but accomplishes that which you send it forth to accomplish. And Father, we know that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would use your word to conform us into the image of Christ. Transform us by the renewing of our minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing that I want us to understand in this passage, and it's really Paul's point here, is that Abraham was saved by grace through faith before he was circumcised. Abraham was saved by grace through faith before he was circumcised. This is a very important point that Paul is trying to make. So much so that he spends all of these verses unpacking what that means in the redemptive plan of God. So he starts by asking this question, which of course brings with it the default answer of, of no. He's already told us that all of us, whether we are Jew or Greek, we are condemned before God. And all of us, whether Jew or Greek, are made right with God through Jesus Christ, through the gospel concerning His Son, right? That our faith is the instrument by which we are united to the Son of God. And when we are united to the Son of God, we are given His perfect righteousness, even as He takes our sin upon Himself. So the answer brings a default no. But what He's trying to do here 
is to get these Jewish Christians to begin to think critically or to begin to think about these things, to have a, a paradigm shift, to understand that it is not circumcision that saves you. It's not the sign that saves you. It's, it's what that represented in the Old Covenant for Abraham or, or for us. It's not the sign that saves us. It is, it is salvation by grace through faith alone. The drumbeat that he is going to continue to beat as we walk through this passage and many more to come. So he asks, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So this idea of blessing, he's asking, is it only for Jews or for Gentiles also? Now what is the blessing that he's talking about here? Well, that links us back to verses 1 through 8. He mentions in verse 3, he says, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. So one of the blessings is being counted righteous in Christ. In verse 5, it says, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So it's, it's justification through belief in Christ. And then, of course, in verses 6 through 8, just as David also speaks of the blessing to the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count or impute his sin. So it is a counting of righteousness, an imputing of righteousness, a justification through faith in Christ, and the forgiveness of our sins. These are the blessings that he's talking about. In other words, can Gentiles be saved? That's the question. Is it only for Jewish people? Are these blessings, these promises to Abraham, these, this covenant with Abraham that we've been talking about on Sunday nights, is this only for Jewish people? Or in some way, are the Gentiles connected? Well, he says, of course, the Gentiles are connected. They are connected through the offspring of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ. But he makes this point by talking about the fact that Abraham himself was saved before he received the sign. He says, for we say that faith was counted to, him, to Abraham as righteousness. How was it counted? Before or after? It was not after, but before. In fact, many of you have not even thought about the fact that Abraham was not circumcised until Genesis chapter 17. He was declared righteous. He received the righteousness of Christ in Genesis chapter 15. He believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, there had been a great expanse of time, according to Jewish reckoning, something like 29 years. And I'm not sure if that's true. But I do know this. If you read in Genesis 16, 16, it says that he was 86 years old. And then in 17, 1, where he is given the covenant of circumcision or the sign of circumcision, he's 99. So it had been at least 13 years, probably more like 14 if you count the conception of Ishmael. Probably sometime around 14 years between the fact or between the time that Abraham was declared righteous and the time that he received the sign. This is Paul's point. So if it had been 29 years, maybe it had been 29 years according to the Jewish reckoning. It had been a very lengthy time from the fact that Abraham was saved in the time that he received the sign of circumcision. And here I think we need to differentiate between what is necessary for salvation and what is necessary for obedience. What is necessary for salvation and what is necessary for obedience. Think about it this way. If Abraham was declared righteous by God in Genesis 15, at least 13 years before he received the sign of circumcision, then could it be possible for the sign of circumcision to be necessary in order for Abraham to receive the righteousness of Christ? No. It's not necessary. It's not necessary for our justification. So his circumcision was not necessary for his salvation. It was necessary for obedience. And we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. We add nothing to our justification. In fact, if you are trying to add anything to your justification, then what you are doing is you are trying to approach God on legalistic terms. 
So if Abraham would have said, look at me, now I am circumcised, now I am justified fully before God, then he would have been in the same position as the Judaizers. It's belief plus some action. Now to be obedient, Abraham had to be circumcised. If you read Genesis 17, you see that anyone that did not receive the sign of circumcision, they were to be cut off from the people. So in order for Abraham to be obedient, he had to be circumcised. circumcised. But his circumcision did nothing to save him. In fact, he was saved for 13 years at least before he was circumcised. And at this point, you're probably thinking, why are you talking to me about this? Just hang with me. I promise we're going to get somewhere. His circumcision was required for obedience, but it did not save him. This is Paul's whole point. Because if circumcision would have been necessary for Abraham to be saved, then it would have been necessary for the Gentiles to be saved as well. Something that Acts 15 gets rid of entirely. And it's much like baptism for us. Our baptism doesn't in any way save us. It doesn't add to our justification, but it is very necessary for obedience. So if you have not been baptized and you are a Christian, you are walking in disobedience to your Lord. The first command He gives us is to be baptized. However, the thief on the cross was not baptized. And he's in heaven. We understand that Paul said, God did not send me, or Christ did not send me to baptize, but rather to share the gospel. We understand that baptism doesn't save us. It doesn't add to our justification. But it is very necessary for obedience. And this is his point. Paul's point is, it's not some act we do. Even an act commanded by God. It's not something we do so that way we can be saved. Because if it's something that we do so that we can be saved, where are we back to? Law keeping. And boasting before God. Here's why, by the way. If you just wanted to say, well, why not? Why not? Why can't I add to my justification? Why, why can't I do something to add to the righteousness? Why can't I just put a little cherry on top and be extra saved by the good things that I do? Here's why. Our righteous standing before God is not based on any action that we do. It is based on the finished work of Christ. No action, no good deed, not circumcision, not baptism, can add to or take away from the finished work of Christ. This is why it's all for His glory. It's all God's glory. No one can stand before God. Remember chapter 4, verse 2. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. He says the same thing in verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting, it is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. You see, if we do anything to earn or merit our salvation then we can boast before God. Look at the great thing I did. But as it stands, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God made us alive together with Christ. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, not because of good works. You see? You see the difference there? This is what's driving this entire passage here. Abraham has nothing to boast about before God. Abraham cannot boast, about, boast before God, not even about circumcision. Abraham would stand in the righteousness of Christ, or he won't stand righteous at all. And that's true for you today as well. So then why was Abraham circumcised? That's what he gets to in verse 11. Abraham was circumcised as a sign and seal of his salvation. Abraham was circumcised as a sign and seal of his salvation. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had, notice past tense, by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So Paul is not in any way saying that circumcision wasn't purposeful. He's not saying that it was to no, uh, to no benefit at all. He's not saying that Abraham just did this because he thought circumcision would be a good time. It was commanded by God. And it was the sign and seal of his salvation. In fact, the circumcision, it was purposeful in that it portrayed the inner reality that was already true of Abraham. So Abraham already had the righteousness of Christ. Do you see that in there? 
He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. He already had the righteousness. It's not as though circumcision made him righteous. He had it already. In fact, he, in case you didn't understand what he was saying, he says it again. He says that it's the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So he had it. And he had it while he was still uncircumcised. So Abraham had already been imputed or given the righteousness of Christ. He was already in right standing with God. So if he had died before he was circumcised, he would be in heaven. This is Paul's point here. He already had the righteousness of Christ. Why would that be important for the Jewish Christians to understand? Because they believed that circumcision was the very thing that marked one out, that made one righteous before God. In fact, if you read through the rabbinic literature, what, it's, what it teaches you is, is that they didn't even believe that someone who was circumcised could possibly go to hell. In fact, they believed that if you committed an idolatry, the only way you could go to hell is if God somehow made your circumcision uncircumcision. So Paul's coming along, which by the way is impossible. Paul's coming along here, and he's saying, look, he was declared righteous before he was circumcised, not after. So the circumcision, it was an outward mark that signified an inner spiritual reality. It was a sign. That's what he calls it. According to BDAG, it is a distinguishing mark by which something is made known, and it, it pointed beyond itself. Uh, R.C. Sproul in his commentary on this passage said that the sign that reads the city limits of Orlando is not the city of Orlando itself. It's a sign. But he goes further. He says it's the sign and the seal. And these things, they have overlap. It's not as though they are totally separate, two opposite things. They have overlap, but they are two different realities. So the sign is something, is a distinguishing mark by which something is made known. A seal is something that confirms the validity or of a, of a reality that is already present. So it is something that confirms the validity of a reality already present. So it signified reality. Let me give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. I know you all have it memorized, but I'm going to read it to you just in case. Paul says this, If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal. It's the same Greek word. You are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now let me ask you a question. If the Corinthians would have rejected Paul as a, an apostle. Say in 2 Corinthians they said, hey, we like the super apostles. Paul, you're not an apostle. Does that mean that Paul's not an apostle? <laughs> of course not. Paul is an apostle whether or not they believed it. But their salvation and their growth through the teaching of Paul, as he shared the gospel with them and taught them the word of God, their growth and their salvation, it shows that his apostleship is genuine. In that way, the Corinthians themselves were the seal of Paul's apostleship. In the exact same way, Abraham had already been made right with God. Brothers and sisters, once you're declared righteous before God, you are right with God. Can we agree with that? Once you receive the righteousness of Christ, you are in right standing before God. Nothing else needs to be added. He received it before he received the sign. So he had already been made right with God. But circumcision was a, a permanent mark. It was an imprint on Abraham's flesh that showed that, that the covenant-keeping God had made a covenant with him. So every time Abraham looked, every time he saw, we won't go into too many specifics, Every time he saw that mark in his flesh, it reminded him that God had made covenant promises to him and that by faith he had been made right with God. I love this, this quotation by William Hendricks. He says this, he says, Signs and seals are very valuable. To be sure, it is possible to overestimate their significance. In and by themselves, these signs in the old covenant, the bloody ones of circumcision and Passover, in the new, the unbloody ones of baptism and the Lord's Supper, they, they do not bring about justification in general or salvation. However, they do indeed signify and seal it in the manner already indicated. And is that not a source of comfort? The rainbow does not in any way save mankind from being swallowed up by a flood. 
but it does signify and seal that God will never again drown the human race. The wedding ring does not bring married bliss, but what married person who loves his or her marriage partner would ever think of doing away with the ring that means so much to him or her? Indeed, signs and seals must not be underestimated. They have great educational and psychological value, but neither should they be overestimated either. You see, that's, that's Paul's point here. The sign and seal was important. It was important for obedience. But Abraham was saved at least 13 years before he ever received the sign and seal of the covenant. Which leads to our third thing then. Abraham was saved, then circumcised, in that order, by God's design. So the third thing, Abraham was saved and then circumcised in that order by God's design. In other words, God did it on purpose. Brothers and sisters, nothing God does is by accident. Did you know that? That our sovereign God of all creation, He doesn't do anything on accident. Not even the order of Abraham's life is by accident. He purposely, purposefully allowed time to pass between Abraham's salvation and his circumcision. This is what Paul is, is looking at here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, superintended by God the Holy Spirit. He is, he is seeing in this passage in Genesis 15 and 17, this, this great gap of time. He's seeing the, the purposes of God. And you think about it, couldn't, have, couldn't God have, have declared Abraham righteous and then taught him to be circumcised immediately? He could have, couldn't he? I mean, it would have been just as easy. But he didn't. He waited. He waited at least 13 years before he gave him the sign. And we understand that Abraham's life is one of, of ups and downs, isn't it? He's called out in Genesis 12. In Genesis 15, God walks through the cut pieces. He is confirmed in the covenant. The covenant is, is confirmed with Abraham. He literally cuts the covenant with him. He declares him righteous. Genesis 17, he receives the sign of the covenant. And then Genesis 22, he offers up Isaac. And God swears by an oath. Do you know all of those things could have happened in about 45 minutes? But they didn't. They happened across Abraham's whole life. And Paul says that's not by accident. It's on purpose. Why? Well, Paul says here it's so that Abraham could be the father of all the faithful. Both the faithful Jew and the faithful Gentile. That's his point. Look what he says here at the end of verse 11 and then in verse 12. The purpose was. Now, that's good, right? Whatever he tells us the purpose was, it gives you an indication that this is probably the purpose. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without, without circumcised, without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Do you see that? Two groups. Paul says the reason why there was such a gap between the time that Abraham was saved and the time that he received the sign of that salvation or that covenant, is because God wanted to make him the father of both Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. You say, well, how? Well, think about the Gentiles. Just think about it. If you're a Gentile person, well, Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised, so that he could show that those who are declared righteous in Christ, they don't have to become Jewish in order to be saved. If you're Jewish, well, Abraham was circumcised. So that he would be the father of the faithful circumcised as well. Do you see? Both camps. Jew and Gentile. Now remember what he said back in chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who, to, who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is what he's talking about here. But notice excuse me, that in both cases... It is faith that is the determinative factor, not circumcision. So you have to ask, faith in what? Now you would hope that you wouldn't have to say that, but because of the culture that we find ourselves swimming in, you have to ask, faith in what? Faith in faith? Being a spiritual person? Having faith that something good will happen? Of course not. It's faith in Jesus Christ, the offspring of Abraham. That's what he says in verses 23 through 25. I don't want to spend too much time there. We're going to see it, Lord willing, in a week or two. He says here, But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. So he's still talking in chapter 4, verse 23, about Genesis 15. 
But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us. The same thing will be counted to us. Who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So it's not faith in faith, it's faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith is an objective faith. And faith, by the way, is not a work that saves you. It's not like God trades in your faith for righteousness. Your faith is the instrument by which you are united to Christ who saves you. Jesus saves you. Your faith unites him, you to Him. So it's not faith in faith, it's faith in Christ. This is Paul's point in Galatians chapter 3. You can turn over there if you'd like. We're going to look at it in more depth later. Not today, but in a week. Or who knows how long. <laughs> So Genesis chapter 3 is a fascinating chapter of the Bible. He talks about how God gave this promise to Abraham by promise, then the law came in 430 years later, and it did, not, uh, it did not do away with the covenant that God made with Abraham. So the law didn't take the place of the Abrahamic covenant. Rather, the law was our tutor until Christ came. But then he says this, But now faith has come, in verse 26, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We are no longer under the law. For in Christ Jesus, you were all sons of God through faith. So see there, if you're in Christ, you are a son of God by faith. Do you see that in your Bible? Now listen. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, right, by the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, that we were baptized into Christ by one spirit. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now listen, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. How? Because Jesus is the true offspring of Abraham. He's the one to whom the promises were fulfilled and actually made. So in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, Paul tells us that if you are in faith, or if you are in Christ by faith in Him, then you are Abraham's offspring. So if you're in Christ, true offspring of Abraham, you're sons of Abraham. Now this is shocking for Jewish people. It's not shocking that Jews are heirs of the promise to Abraham through the Messiah. That is not shocking. That is the hope they have. It's not a surprise to them. The shocking thing is, is that Gentiles are as well. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't know where Ephesians is, it's right after Galatians. If you need help with that, General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can thank me later if you like. Ephesians chapter 3. Now listen to this, because this is a shocking reality for Paul and for all Jewish people. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. They knew something of it. You can find it in the Psalms, you can find it in the prophets, but it wasn't revealed in the same way. They didn't have this clarity. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Fellow heirs with who? The faithful Jewish people. Members of the same body with who? The faithful Jewish people. Partakers of the promise. What promise? The promises to Abraham. How? In Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I don't want to spoil too much because we're walking through the covenants, but once we get to the new covenant, what you will see is, is that Jesus is the true offspring of Abraham. He's the second Adam, the true offspring of Abraham. He is the true and greater David. He is true Israel. He is the fulfillment of all the covenants. So when you are in Him as the true offspring of Abraham, as the true Israelite, as the true son of David, well then guess what? You are partakers of the promise. Now why am I saying all of that? 
this. Here's the reason. Here's Paul's main point in all of this. God has made a way for anyone, Jew or Gentile, to be saved. It's not by works. It's not by religious rites. It's not by ancestry. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. No one will be saved outside of Christ. And no one will be saved in any other way. So let me ask you this this morning. Have you been made right with God? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you turned away from your sins and have you called out to Him, admitting that you are a sinner who cannot save yourself? Asking in Him, or asking Him rather, to save you. Giving your whole life over to Him as your Lord. Is that true of you today? I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm not asking you if you were baptized when you were an infant or if you've been uh, down the aisle a hundred times. I'm asking you, is it a present true reality of you today? Is the posture of your heart one towards repentance and faith in Christ? Are you saved by Jesus? Have you been united to Him? That's the question. You're, you're not going to be saved because of works. You can do a billion religious things. I can baptize you every day until the day of your death. You will never be saved unless you trust in Christ alone. You'll, you'll never be saved by your ancestry. Maybe you say, well, I've got a Baptist preacher on my, on my father's side. Like you have an uncle. Who's bad. Everybody in the world has a Baptist preacher somewhere in their family. It's because there are so many Baptist preachers. It's true. But that can't save you. You see, that's, that's Paul's point here. He's not just telling the Jewish people that Gentiles can be saved. He's also telling them you won't be saved because you're Jewish. You're either in Christ or you're not. You either walk in the faith of Abraham or you don't. You're either saved or you're not. There's no mushy middle. There's no separate place for the morally upright. It's heaven or it's hell. It's in Christ or it's not. Have you trusted in Jesus today for salvation? That's the question. Now, I do want to ask a secondary question. Baptism is not necessary for justification. However, it is necessary for obedience. Have you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior but not been baptized? Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but you know the answer to that. If you have not, I want you to set up a time with me, and I want to talk to you about baptism. What it means, what it doesn't mean, why you should go through with it, how we baptize. I, I want to impress upon you the importance of doing what Jesus commands. Not necessary for justification, but very necessary for obedience. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, then I want to offer you the opportunity to come to know Him. The Bible says that we by birth are separated from God. We have a sin nature that manifests itself in sinful actions. And there's nothing we can do about it. No matter how hard we try, we are still a sinner. In fact, one sin in your ledger is enough to separate you from God for all eternity in hell. Because of that, we pursue various things to try to mend the brokenness in our lives that all of us feel. So we pursue popularity or possessions or pleasure or power in the world. But the more that we pursue those things, the more broken we actually become. And you know that. The Bible says none of those things can save us. Only a relationship with Christ can save us. It doesn't mean that your situation is going to change, but it does mean that you will be made a new creation. You will be reconciled to your Creator, and He will walk through the valleys with you. Your circumstances may not change, but your eternal destiny will. And that's what truly matters. <clears throat> Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, or are you playing religion? That's the question. If you do, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord if you know Jesus Christ, that your sins have been washed away, and that in the place of your sins you have the righteousness of Christ. And listen, there is nothing, there is nothing that God will ever find out about you that's going to make that righteousness go away. Isn't that great? The reality of it is, before He saved us, He knew us loved us, 
And he knew everything we were ever going to do. And when we came to faith in Christ, when we received the righteousness of Christ through faith, listen, all of our sins of the past were gone. The sins of the present were gone. The sins we'll commit in the future, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west. They have already been paid for by Jesus on the cross. And we stand clothed in His perfect righteousness. Not because we're better than anybody else. Not because we've done enough good things or done enough religious rites to somehow <coughs> earn our merit. But because we have been united to Christ. Because in Him we have life and we have life eternal. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we have much to be thankful for. If you don't know Jesus, I would urge you on the authority of God's Word to repent of your sins and trust in Him. Only He can save you. Let's go before the Lord. We're going to have a time of response. I'm going to lead us in a prayer as the ladies come up and play. Whatever it is the Lord has laid upon your heart, that's what I pray that you'll do this morning. Let's go before Him and let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, Lord, we come to You this morning in awe of Your grace and mercy. Father, we stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Father, we know that if we were standing in our own righteousness, we would be condemned to an eternity in hell. That our good deeds are as filthy rags before You. That the righteousness that You require is the righteousness that you give at our salvation. And Father, we know that once we have been united to Christ by faith, there is nothing we add to, there is nothing we take away from, Lord. The righteousness is complete, and it is based not on our works, but on the finished work of Christ. Father, let us perish the thought that somehow we are adding to the righteousness of Christ by the things that we do. And yet, Father, you command us to be obedient. The first step of obedience is baptism. And so, Lord, I pray that for anyone in here who knows Jesus, who has not been baptized, I pray that they will come and they will find me and talk to me about what it means to be baptized. Father, I know there are many other things in our life that you command us to do. And so, Father, we pray that you would enable us through your Spirit to walk in holiness. To put to death sinful tendencies. Lord, that we would walk in the light. And Father, we know that even though our good deeds, even though our efforts after our salvation are not, are not perfect, our motives are always tainted with sin, Lord, they are pleasing to you. That even though it's the Holy Spirit working in and through us, you will still reward us for the obedience. So, Father, thank you for loving us as a father loves his children. Father, thank you for adopting us into your family. Not because we're good enough, but because we are in your Son, the eternally begotten. Father, I pray for those that don't know you that today for them would be the day of salvation. Lord, help us to meditate on these truths. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.